So let's start. Uh, as most of you already hopefully know me, I am Professor Mahmoud. Okay, and my email address is mahmoud at bridgeport.edu. Supposed to be somebody recording with a camera. Okay, <laughs> okay. I just wanted to verify. Okay. Um, so uh, this class, as you already know, is Computer Science 440. The official title is Windows Programming. And if you go to the catalog description, it still talks about uh, C++, but uh, in reality, we'll be uh, covering C sharp. Uh, in this particular course, okay? So we'll start from the basics of C-sharp and go to an advanced level, okay? Uh, so in a, in a minute, I'll give you the idea or the overview of the course, but uh, as far as uh, my contact information is concerned, uh, that's the email address and phone number for my office is 203-576-4738. Okay, office hours, uh, I'll put out outside my office and you'll uh, hopefully will be able to, uh, or, or, or I'll put it on the website so that you know how to contact me. Okay, we also have a graduate assistant for this course, is Somaya here? No? Okay. Um, so Somaya is our graduate assistant and I'll put her information also uh, on the website. And I forgot to mention, the course website is http kiwi k i w i dot bridgeport dot edu slash cs four four zero no spaces okay uh, so once you go over there uh, you'll see the handouts for the course okay uh, so uh, because all lectures are videotaped, uh, you guys can download these video lectures on your own machine. And the, um, uh, so for that, you will need a username and password. So username is ubstudent1. Okay, no spaces again, but ubstudent1 and password is UB, all lowercase, UB student 2011. Okay, so once you log in, you'll be uh, able to access all the handouts. Um, also, there will already be video lectures for last year when the course was taught. Okay, uh, so this year it's fall 2015. So I'll be creating a link for for example, video lectures for fall 2015. Okay, so now there's two ways you can get the video of a lecture. You right click on the link and save target as and copy the uh, video on your own machine. Okay, but because the uh, number of students is, is large uh, and uh, all my classes are videotaped, uh, so if you try to download it from the server, it may be too slow, okay? Uh, so I will put the in information of the recording GA. Uh, so what you will do is you'll go directly to the recording GA, take your flash drive or, or uh, zip drive it, if it has enough uh, room in it, uh, and just download it straight from uh, the recording GAs. This way you don't have to wait half an hour to get the lecture, right? Okay, um, so usually uh, our class is Monday, Wednesday. So usually by Thursday, the video lectures will be available, okay, uh, for, uh, for that week, okay. Uh, in case you needed it earlier, like I said, you can always email the graduate assistant and go and get the video lectures, right? Okay, so the benefit of the video lectures is that for some reason, uh, you were unable to come to the class, uh, you'll still have a full recording of what was covered in the course. Uh, I highly recommend, even though you have access to the video lectures, to, to come to the class. 
Uh, some students uh, become lazy and uh, say, and watch the lecture. But I think it's for your own benefit to come to the class and this way you know what questions were asked and uh, uh, in case you have a doubt, you can ask the questions, right? Okay, uh, is there a textbook for the course? No textbook? Okay, if you wanted to buy a book, you can just go to Amazon, search for C Sharp and whatever uh, book has good reviews, you can buy it. But uh, for every topic that I cover, uh, I have my own handouts, which will be put on the website. So in my opinion, they are enough. Uh, so really, you don't need any textbook. Okay? Um, as far as uh, the grading is concerned, everybody is interested in how will they get a A grade in the course. So uh, the grading in the course is relative meaning you are competing between yourselves, okay? Uh, we will have uh, two tests and one final, okay? Uh, and the weight of each test will be, uh, roughly speaking, 30%, uh, sorry, 25%. Uh, okay, so two tests, 25% each. Okay, uh, final 30%, so that makes it 80%, and 20% will be assignments and projects. <coughs> okay, so once you're done with the course, uh, we will do a, a calculation, and let's say the highest student has 83.2 uh, in the in in the course, right? So the highest student always gets an A. Okay. Uh, let's say the next student is eighty-one point seven, then seventy-five point eight, seventy-three point four, seventy-two point seven, sixty-five point eight, and so on. Sixty-three. Okay. So the way I do the grading is. Um, if you're the highest, you get, get an A. Every, everybody else gets compared to it. If you're closer to that score, uh, the next student, because there's, they are pretty close, uh, also gets an A. Then I look for a gap. So if I see, oh, for example, there's a five, six point gap over here. So obviously this will be the next grade level. These are all closed, okay? And so again, if there's a bigger gap, this will be B plus. B plus and so on, okay? So, and of course, if you are scoring, you know, less than 30, uh, for example, in your exams and not submitting any assignments, then obviously you'll, you will not pass the course, right? Okay, so um, how can you do well in the course? Let me give you my advice. Okay, the best way to do well in the course is really the assignments and projects, okay? And by doing it yourself, okay? Because the way I uh, make the exams and the final is, they are very similar to the assignments and projects, okay? And if you did not do it yourself, you went to another student who's, uh, who's really good in programming and they did all the work for you, you'll have no clue in the test and no clue in the final. So you may do well in the 20% part of it, but in the 80% part of it, you will not do well, right? So in my opinion, uh, even if you got, let's say, 10% uh, over here, you only did half of them correct. You have a better chance of getting a, a better grade as opposed to getting perfect over here and your tests are just 40% uh, uh, are weaker, right? So I myself doubt it if I see some student perfect assignments and projects, but on the exams, it's very poor. So to me, that student did not do any work. So I'll give that student a worse grade, okay? However, if I see a student who is only getting, let's say, half the assignments correct, but submitting it, okay? But on the exams also, it's at least half of it is correct. I will favor that student more and give that student a better grade than, uh, you know, where they fall. Okay. Uh, so, 
So try to do the assignments and projects. Okay, I know you guys are friends with each other. Usually you, uh, one person does the work, everybody else copies it. This is the worst thing you can do for yourself. Okay, uh, even if your friend is smarter than you, says, oh, I'll do it and you can just see how I did it. Don't take the help, okay, uh, because you won't learn anything, right? I say this advice every time, but it always doesn't work, so, but let me try in any case. Okay, so please try to do the assignments and projects yourself, and of course, if you're new to this programming, you'll get stuck, right? Uh, since you'll get stuck, where do you go to? Don't go to your friend, because uh, then you'll get the complete solution and you won't learn anything. Go to the teaching assistant or the graduate assistant, and I'll put the information on the website. Okay, her job is to make sure you understand, okay? She won't give you the solution, but she will explain where your problem is, okay? Um, so anyway, uh, so that's about, uh, so once again, to summarize, no textbook. Roughly speaking, this is how the breakdown will be, okay? Uh, and since our goal is to learn the C-sharp language, okay, uh, let me give you a brief idea of the language itself. Okay, so in my opinion, um, a programming language <coughs> is just a tool, okay? See, just like uh, you guys, uh, when you started your high school or your college, right? You learned how to use a calculator, okay? Uh, and why do we use the calculator? So that any long computations, rather than us doing by hand, we can get it done very quickly, right? So that's the purpose of a programming language, okay? Is one programming language better than the other? Uh, no. There's, you can program anything in any programming language in the world, right? And there are hundreds of programming languages. So the question is, what should you learn, okay? You cannot learn all hundred of these programming languages. So the answer is, uh, take a look at what's popular right now. Popular does not mean it's the best language, okay? However, we have to follow, uh, you know, the rest of the world, you cannot create your own uh, tiny environment and say, I'll just do this and <coughs> ignore the rest of the world, okay? So if we take a look at what are the most popular uh, top five programming languages. Uh, so guess uh, what they are? Okay. C -sharp. Not C Sharp. C Sharp is not the top language. Java, Java. Java is right now the top language, okay? Then C, C++, they go together, okay. Uh, Python is below C sharp, then goes C sharp, then goes Python. Ruby. And, no, Ruby is way down. And uh, JavaScript is becoming very popular uh, as a language, right? So, and there are other languages, okay. Uh, so in my opinion, because you guys are uh, computer scientists, right? Or some of you may be computer engineering. But anyway, since you guys are related to the computer science or computer engineering field, before you graduate, make sure you are decent. You don't have to be 100% expert in all of these languages, but you should feel comfortable that, uh, you know, you can be fluent in one of these because everybody has a preference. So some of you may prefer Java, some of you may prefer C, C++. So if you are given something to solve, you may go to your favorite language to solve, but if you, let's say, get a job and your job has a project which was already done in, let's say, Python, you should be able to, you know, uh, understand and modify the code, okay? Uh, so anyway, the reason you guys are taking C Sharp is, of course, to make sure that as part of this, uh, you uh, are familiar with one of the popular languages, okay? Uh, once you guys start looking for a job, you'll see in US, uh, actually, these are not as popular as, a, I mean, they, they are needed, but 
the job description will not say, you know, we're looking for just a Python programmer. They will say it's good to have Python expertise or JavaScript expertise. But right now, there are three types of jobs. Okay. Uh, either you will be doing Java development if you get hired as a software programmer, or if you are especially in computer engineering, electrical engineering, uh, C is still the most popular popular language when it comes to hardware, and a little bit of C++. Okay, um, and uh, the other third of the companies or 20% of the companies, whatever that number is, are based on the Microsoft.NET technologies, and C Sharp is the popular language, right? Uh, anyway, so in this course, my goal is to make you guys an expert in C Sharp, okay? One of the nice things about C Sharp and Python, but no, so, not so much Java, C, or C++, the learning curve, over here uh, is easier, so easy to learn. Pro provided you focus on the concepts, once you understand the concept, you will see both of these are very elegantly designed languages. And once you get the uh, fundamentals, you can pretty much guess how, uh, uh, even if you didn't know about a certain part, you can guess. and. And these days, uh, so much code is available on the internet, you can easily solve the problem, right? Okay, now, uh, the other good thing is, uh, especially, uh, and to some extent, Python as well, okay, these are all C-based languages, okay? All of these are, from a syntax point of view, so all these languages that I mentioned are C-based, for the most part. Python varies a little bit, but uh, Java, C, C++, JavaScript, C Sharp, okay, they use the C syntax, okay? Now, the C syntax is... is very straightforward, okay? Um, you know, just like uh, there's a philosophy behind the syntax or, or, or a convention behind the language, uh, same way in C style languages, uh, the, the fundamental syntax goes like this, okay? If you have to declare a variable, okay, uh, you will always start by name of data type, followed by name of variable, okay, and then the semicolon, okay. So for example, okay, if you wanted to declare a variable to store an integer, okay, uh, it doesn't matter, it's Java, C, C++, C Sharp, you will do int, for example, A. So that's the name of the data type is integer, uh, variable is A, right, same way Take a look, double B, right? Uh, so all of these languages follow the same style. Okay, now in all of these languages, we write functions, okay? Uh, so that we can call this function and have it do something useful for us. Okay, so it, even when we write a function, we follow the exact same uh, concept, okay? Uh, so remember the purpose of a function is to return something, right? So suppose we wanted to write a function called compute, a, compute AVG, okay? So name of the function is compute AVG, okay? Uh, what data will it return will come before the name of the function. So if we are taking average of three numbers, it will be double most likely. So double compute AVG, you can see name of data type comes first, Followed by, let me just modify it, name of variable or name of function, okay? And then followed by, if it is a function, what parameters will it take? If it will take three parameters in C, and then whatever statements you are writing. Uh, so this is how we'll declare a function, right? Okay, so again, same thing in Java, same thing in C, C++, same thing in C Sharp. 
So in a way, because all of you either are coming from a Java background or C, C++ background, okay? So uh, syntax-wise, you already know C Sharp, so that's the good news, okay? Uh, of course, there are minor variations between C, C++, uh, Java, and, and tiny bit in C Sharp, but if you know Java, then C Sharp is extremely <coughs> similar. <coughs> Okay, uh, like I said, few variations from C, C++, but these two can be learned simultaneously. So if you didn't know Java, you learned C Sharp first. Literally within a day, you can uh, learn Java and vice versa. So if you already knew Java, within a day, you can learn at least 80% of C Sharp, okay? As we go along, it starts to vary a little bit, okay? so. Okay, so as we start to create larger and larger programs, okay, uh, so our goal will be to start out with small, simple programs, but as we go along, we want to write large programs. Okay, uh, so of course, if we write a large program in a poor style, it will be very difficult to upgrade or maintain, right? So uh, large programs are written in good object-oriented style. Okay, they are also written these days uh, in, by following uh, proven design patterns. So simply knowing how to create a class uh, is not enough these days. You also have to understand some of the design patterns. Uh, there are many, many design patterns. Uh, what is a design pattern? Design pattern is basically, think of it as a section of code that we write to solve a problem. And it has been proven to be the best uh, approach to solving a particular type of problem, right? Or think of it as a recipe for a certain uh, 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 problem that you are trying to solve, okay? So along the way, not only we will learn good object-oriented programming style, we will also learn the proper design patterns as our programs start to become bigger and bigger, okay? Um, so let me now, uh, give you a brief history of uh, the object-oriented programming and the design patterns and show you the motivation why we need this, okay? So as far as history of software development is concerned, okay, let's go to, let's say, 50, 60 years ago, okay, when programming was new, okay? Um, do you guys know which programming language was popular in the early days of computing? Mm -hmm. Pascal. Okay, Pascal was one of them. Cobol, and even before Pascal and Cobol. Fortran. Fortran. Okay. So Fortran was one of the first popular languages. Actually, it's still uh, popular amongst uh, physicists uh, and chemists because once they do a lot of these molecular type of computations, they still use Fortran, okay? Uh, anyway, uh, in Fortran, uh, typically you will write a few statements like A equal to five, B equal to seven, C equal to A plus B, right? And you will keep going. And as you are writing statements, some time you will say, go to 45. So, so pretend there are a lot of lines over here. 45 line is over here. So remember, a computer executes in a, in a straight line. It will execute this statement, next, 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 right? Once it comes to over here, it will execute this statement. Then after executing a few lines, we may say go to 30 in a Fortran code. So 30 may be somewhere over here, okay? So then uh, we may further uh, say over here go to 65, for example, so 65 was over here, 
So anyway, in short, uh, if you wrote a small Fortran program using these go-tos, you can easily trace it. Uh, if, you, if you were given a job to upgrade this program, you can start from the beginning and say, OK, I came here, then I went over here, then I went over here, then I went over here, then I came over here, right? OK, now, uh, if it was, let's say, less than 100 lines long, you can easily trace it and see this is what the program is doing. But as soon as it became, let's say, greater than a few hundred lines, okay, you yourself will get a headache going through and see and saying, oh, what is it doing? You know, I went here, then I went somewhere else. Okay, so uh, as soon as our program started to become slightly bigger, we realized of ourselves that this programming style does not lead to larger programs. Okay? You can develop them, but then they are very difficult to understand, very difficult to upgrade, very difficult to maintain. Right? Okay, so as soon as we realized, <coughs> we can uh, see this programming style, by the way, was called unstructured programming. Okay? Some people even re refer to it as a sp spaghetti code, okay? You know, just like noodles get intertwined, so these go-tos are like the noodles, okay? Uh, so anyway, um, roughly speaking about 40, 45 years ago, okay, uh, we s came up with a better style uh, so that we can write large programs in a reliable manner, okay? And we call the style structured programming. So what's the improvement we did? Uh, we basically said, let's reorganize this code. Uh, and we developed some guidelines. Okay, So one of the guidelines was no go-tos. Because they make it very difficult to trace the execution flow. Okay, We also developed another guideline, uh, break the program in small functions and subroutines. Okay, a subroutine is another name for a function. If a function does not return any single answer, we call it a subroutine. If it computes something and gives us like a double or integer or boolean, we call it a function. Okay. So anyway, uh, so by reorganizing this program. Okay, uh, so in the structured programming, once we reorganize this code, there will be a starting function. We call it the main function. Okay, then rest of the code will be broken into small functions and subroutines. Okay, pretend each box is a function, right? So suppose you wrote ten functions, you wrote five subroutines. Okay, uh, so then we further developed a guideline that our main will not do any computation. It will simply call the function at some point, have it compute, give an answer back. Then sometime later, it will call another function, have it compute, bring the answer back, right? So the main is basically the controller over here, calling these functions, bringing the result, doing something with it, making a decision, calling another function or subroutine, right? So anytime we create a new programming style, we usually create a new language to go with this style. So new programming language, okay? So what were the programming languages that we introduced with structured programming? See, this is where, as you guys were mentioning, Pascal, Cobol, mm -hmm. even C, uh, they were created in the structured programming uh, mm -hmm. to support the structured programming. Okay? So for example, if you write a C program, remember there's always a main. Okay? You're always writing small functions and subroutines. right? One of the guidelines over here was that no function should have more than uh, 50 lines of code. Again, this is a guideline, okay? Uh, meaning, if you wrote a 70 line function, it's okay. But on the average, you will not try to write a bigger function, okay? So this way, it's easy to see, somebody can see, oh, 
uh, within 50 lines. Remember, we can easily trace what it's doing and, and modify it, upgrade it, right? Okay, so and the, another benefit of the structured programming style was um, that we can do team development, okay? Uh, for example, let's say we have four developers available in our company. Okay, uh, one of them could be given these five functions. Another developer could be given another five functions to develop. Another developer would be responsible for the five subroutines. And then the main architect will assemble everything, write the main, make sure the whole application works, right? So uh, because all the tasks are nicely uh, broken down, uh, large software development becomes a little bit easier in this style, right? So just, just like um, you guys are now taking C Sharp to learn another language, when I was in college, the first language that I uh, took a course in was Pascal, okay? And uh, I remember my professor saying, oh, this is so neat. Okay, and he was telling everybody to pay attention uh, because rest of your life you'll be programming uh, in this language or in this style, right? Uh, so anyway, everybody was uh, excited about Pascal, but what happened to Pascal? Does anybody program in it? No, okay. Uh, will anybody be programming in C Sharp 10 years from now? No. Probably not. Okay, there will be some new language, right? Okay, mm -hmm. so as you all know, in technology, we all get excited about something new, we learn it, then five, ten years later, something better comes, and we go after the better thing, right? Okay, so the question is, do we do this because we get bored with some technology, or is there a reason for it, okay? And the answer is, 99% of the, 99.99% of the time, it's not because we got bored with Pascal and we needed another language. It's because we find problems with the language or with the technology <coughs> or with the programming style, okay? So we create new technology. Okay, regardless is programming or hardware or whatever, 99% of the time because we discover, okay, so because we discover problems with the existing technology, okay? And to fix those problems, we create something new, okay? And then we get all excited about it. It takes us five, 10 years to realize, oh, even whatever we created new has newer problems, okay? And then to fix those newer problems, we create another technology, right? So C Sharp, Java, they'll fade out, okay, in the next five, 10 years. But it would not be because we got bored with them. It will be because we found some, some newer things that they are not good at solving. And to support those, we will create a new language, right? Uh, so that's why whenever you learn something, understanding the concepts uh, is very, very important. Uh, because then you, it's very easy for you to adapt to something new because you already know why uh, a particular thing works, right? Okay, so anyway, so let's come back to over here. What could be the problem with this style? At first, it seems pretty reasonable. We can do team development, we can do small tasks at a time, right? So here's the uh, main, main problem with this style, okay? Some of you who have programmed in C would remember, we can create some variables and declare them above any function or subroutine. Okay, and what are those variables called? Global, global variables. Okay, global variables are available in any function or subroutine. For example, suppose you had a variable over here called balance of a customer. <coughs> now, one of the functions which is uh, doing the payment processing as an example can go and change the balance. Okay. Now let's pretend another function which is trying to display it 
also tries to access the balance. Okay? Now, what if somebody made a mistake one day as they were modifying the code? Uh, their formula was, had a small error in it, right? Okay, so all of a sudden, the code was working one day, and now it's, it's still running, but it's giving a wrong answer, okay? Uh, so those type of problems are extremely difficult to debug, right? As you start writing larger and larger programs, if your program gives you a compiler error, it's very easy to fix. If your program is running but gives you a wrong answer, now it's a difficult thing to, to fix, right? Um, so anyway, uh, so one of the problems with the structured programming, so the problem with this technology is open access to global variables. So any function can go read the variable, any function can modify this variable. Okay. Uh, so, especially in a team environment, see if you yourself were developing the whole thing, it wouldn't be a problem because you'll know I made the modification over here, right? Especially if you have a larger so set of four developers, but if you have 40 developers, one of the developers went and changed something and all of a sudden it's not working. Now, who will you go and check? Uh, so, uh, so, that was the fundamental problem with structured programming that we were using global variables and everybody had access to it, right? So as soon as we realize a problem, we are very good as, at coming up with the solution, okay? So we said, all right, here's the problem. <coughs> to solve it, we came up with this technology called object-oriented programming. Okay, so let me now explain what is object-oriented programming, okay, and how it makes our program writing better than just the plain structured programming. Okay, so uh, let me emphasize one more part. Whenever we create a new technology, okay, it's not like we throw away everything and start all over. We keep all the good lessons that we have learned, and wherever the problem is, we improve that problem. Okay, so very similarly, you know, for example, writing small functions uh, was a good idea, okay? Uh, so we don't wanna give that up away. We don't want to write a function with 5,000 lines of code, okay? Um, so because this was the culprit, so this is what we did in object-oriented programming. We took few of these global variables. So we took few of these global variables then we looked at few of the functions or subroutines which closely are related to these variables. So for example, if it's the balance of a customer, whatever function is modifying the balance, whatever function is displaying the balance, those functions or subroutines will be picked up. So these boxes are the functions or subroutines. And then we will pack them into a virtual box Okay, and we will, in the object-oriented programming terminology, we'll call it a class, and we'll <coughs> give it a name, some name. For example, customer processing, or customer, for example, okay? Begin curly, end curly. So it will have a few variables, like customer name, ID, balance, and so on. Then this will be update balance, display balance, or whatever the case may be, right? So very similarly, we went back over here, to, took a look at some of other global variables, pretend there are many of these, okay? And we picked some more variables, and then whatever functions or subroutines are closely related to those variables, we package them into another class, okay? And for example, this could be a class called payment as an example, this could be a class called customer, okay? Uh, and so basically, as I mentioned, we reorganize this whole uh, code that we have written by picking these variables and further putting them in a box, further putting in a virtual box. Okay, it's not a physical box, it's a virtual box, right? So just by reorganizing, uh, 
in creating these classes, this is one of the concepts in object-oriented programming, okay? Now, if we were just simply to reorganize it, like picking a few functions and closely, uh, sorry, picking a few variables and closely related functions and putting them into a virtual box, if, if this is what we sim uh, simply did, it still will not solve this problem of open access to global variables. Why? Now let's pretend one developer is re responsible for developing this class, customer. Another developer is uh, responsible for the payment class, right? Okay, the code over here can go and uh, update the balance uh, as an example or change something, right? Uh, sorry, uh, the variable is over here. So the code over here, if this is one of the variables called balance, okay, uh, the code written in one of the payment methods can go and change this, okay? So we'll be back to the same original problem. We have a team environment. The data in one of the classes is being changed by somebody else, okay? So in, uh, in good object-oriented programming, so, so this was the general concept, right? In good object-oriented programming, we protect our data. From unauthorized changes from outside of our class. Okay, so simply creating classes will not solve the problem. Further, what we do is each data that we put inside of our class we use keywords as private, private, okay? Uh, same thing over here, all data over here will be marked private, 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 okay? Now what does private mean? If the code from inside this class goes and tries to modify it, it is okay. But if the code from outside of this class meaning a payment class in this example, tries to modify the balance, what will happen? Well, it will not be allowed access, it will be denied access because it's private, okay? Uh, so just like the data could be marked private, same way the functions that we write can also be marked public or private, okay? So let me ask you a question now. Suppose you created a class with a few variables and few functions, and you mark everything private. <coughs> private, so the data is marked private, functions are marked private. Okay, uh, suppose the name of the class is XYZ. Okay, will this be useful to us, this class? No. What will happen if somebody from the outside of the class tries to modify the variable? Yeah. They, won't yeah. they won't be allowed access. What if they try to call a function? They won't be allowed access. <coughs> okay. So it's useless thing, okay? Uh, to give you an example, uh, a physical example, so that you can relate to this concept, okay? See, in my opinion, a good example of uh, an object-oriented system in real life is how do we put a computer together? Okay, laptop is not a good example because everything is so bundled together. But if you go to one of our labs where there's a box, a computer box sitting, right? Okay, and if you open this box, you will see there's a big circuit board in it. Okay, anybody knows what that's called? The motherboard, motherboard right? <laughs> Okay, uh, so now this motherboard has some wires going uh, into a small box over here. Okay, if you type something on the keyboard, okay, this box makes a noise. Do you know what that box is? 
hard drive, right? So can we have more than one hard drive in our computer? Yes. 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 yes, so some people can put one more hard drive over here, right? Okay, so now think of a hard drive as a class called hard drive. Okay, in terms of software. Okay, so, but however, in this example, we have two hard drives. So do we have two classes? See, when we say a class in, in programming, all it means is think of a class as like a category or type. Okay, we are saying uh, this particular box is of type hard drive. This particular box is of type hard drive, okay? But we have two hard drives, okay? So in the object-oriented programming, we create objects of a class to represent physical entities. So because we have two physical entities over here, two hard drives, okay, um, uh, if we were doing program, writing a program to represent this, we will do something like this. Hard drive. D1 equal to new hard drive. Okay, so suppose this hard drive is called D1. Okay, uh, but we have a second hard drive. It also is of the same category as this one. So we will do, in programming, we will create two objects, hard drive D2 equal to new hard drive, okay? So D1 is called one object. Anytime we create an object, it has to belong to a category <coughs> or class. So this object belongs to which class? Hard, hard drive. drive. Belongs to hard drive class, right? Okay, same way D2 is another object, which also belongs to the hard drive class, okay? Uh, so anyway, now let's come back to this concept, the original question. What if we mark everything private? Okay. Now, marking everything private, as I mentioned, basically means nobody can access, nobody can call the function, nobody can call, uh, access the data, right? So let's come back to our hard drive. Uh, if hard drive was completely sealed, meaning you cannot see the data inside, you can go, cannot go and ask for data to store or to read, so it will be perfectly sealed box. Will it be useful to us? No. Yeah. We won't be able to store anything, we won't be able to read anything from it, right? So it will be, in terms of programming, it would be exactly if we marked everything private, okay? Uh, so something has to be available to us for us to be able to use that, uh, uh, use that entity. So we have two options, or we have four options, or three options. Let's make everything available. So let's make everything public. Public. So the data. Public and object-oriented terminology means from the outside somebody can read it, change it, modify it. So one option is we put everything public over here, public over here. So everybody can call the function, everybody can modify the data. Of course, that will make it useful, right? But is that a good idea? No. Yeah. If we make the data public, what problem we are running into in the software development world? <coughs> See, we are back to this Pascal problem. Anybody can modify the data and the reliability of the large software goes down, okay? Uh, so everybody agrees the 
data has to be protected. Data has to be right. right. In terms of the hard drive example, okay, when we say data has to be pro private, what does it mean? It really means we're putting a box around it because inside it there's a magnetic platter. Nobody has to see what <coughs> that is. So nobody can touch it physically this way. Data will stay safe, okay? But to be able to read the data, uh, modify the data, we do need some kind of a cable coming out of this box, okay? And those are either these functions, okay, or with every data, as you will see, or some of you are already used to writing it, with every private data, we'll write two tiny functions, okay? One we call a get function. Its job is to read data. And one we call a set function. Its job is to modify data. So every private data will have two tiny functions associated with it. Okay, so this will be our philosophy. Okay, now those of you who are coming from